So the carnivore diet. First, for those unfamiliar with me, with this channel, yes, I am vegan, but um, I don't think I'm coming at this like a normal vegan, like many of the popular vegans on YouTube would come at this. Um, and that's primarily because I am vegan purely for uh, environmental and ethical animal welfare reasons. I do not believe that it is necessary to be vegan for health. The most important things for health really have little, if nothing, to do with specific foods, right? I mean, it's things that we all already know. Don't eat too many calories. Don't smoke. Don't drink too much. Get some physical activity. Get enough sleep manage your stress. You can achieve this on most any diet, virtually any diet, assuming that it is balanced enough to the point that you are meeting all of your nutrient needs, right? I mean, obviously it doesn't matter how fit you are if you are deficient in some vitamin or mineral. Your health will suffer sometimes greatly, right? I mean, you can eat the healthiest plant-based vegan diet, but if you are not supplementing for B12, you're not healthy. Now, there may be some additional benefits when it comes to limiting or, you know, including certain foods. So limiting certain um, animal products and like saturated fat or limiting processed sugar. But as the evidence on the whole stands right now, these things just aren't nearly as important as the things that I mentioned before. Once you start really limiting certain foods or food groups or excluding, completely excluding certain food groups, now you're getting into kind of uh, diminishing returns territory. The effort that you are putting in might not be worth the small benefits. Also, while there are people who can eat a lot of processed foods and like not get fat, this is clearly not the norm. Um, I always think about that guy. I think the New York Times profiled him a long time ago, but he was eating just like refined carbs and candy and like cereal. That's like all he ate basically. Um, and he was super skinny and fit. Obviously, this guy's an anomaly. He's not the norm. The data is clear that most of us eating this way, the kind of standard American diet, whatever you want to call it, that we will suffer from it, right? Like we will overeat and our health will suffer. We need to eat predominantly unprocessed, not as enticing foods in order to keep from eating too much. For more info on why we overeat, I highly recommend Stefan Guillene. I think that's how you say it. Um, his work, he's an obesity researcher, and he talks a lot about overeating and what he calls high reward foods, these super sugary, salty, fatty, ultra processed foods. Basically, they're the reason why it is so hard in the US and other industrialized places to lose weight and keep it off because we are just constantly surrounded buy these super delicious foods. Anyway, I just wanted to throw all that out there for anyone new watching so that you know I'm not coming at this from a vegan is the healthiest diet or the only healthy diet or, you know, whatever. Um, again, I'm vegan for ethical, for environmental, for um, like societal health reasons, you know, things like antibiotic resistant superbugs. To be clear, they're bad. I'm not in favor of them. I said that like I was real excited about them. <laughs> I think the like personal health arguments for it, uh, for veganism are seriously lacking, especially when we're talking about like low fat veganism, like what's promoted in the what the health documentary. Basically, you can eat a vegan diet healthfully, but you do not have to go vegan to be healthy. Okay, so on to the carnivore diet, which unsurprisingly is a diet made up of solely meat or mostly meat. Some people, um, I think, do eat like eggs. Uh, some people even drink milk, but it seems like the kind of high profile carnivores like Michaela Peterson, they eat much more limited forms. I mean, it's already a very limited diet, obviously, but like she is only eating beef and salt and water. And I know a lot of the uh, carnivore, carnivore fans, <laughs> <laughs> it's weird calling them carnivores because carnivore kind of has a a meaning, but <laughs> whatever, whatever. Yeah, a lot of them are anti-dairy, so I don't think it's very common to drink dairy on the carnivore diet, but I could be wrong about that. Again, most of the high profile kind of known people are not consuming dairy. Regardless, it is obviously a very restrictive diet. It is even more restrictive than um, a vegan diet, than a low fat vegan diet, than a paleo diet, than a keto diet. And Obviously, anytime you restrict your diet, you um, avoid certain foods, you are going to have to work 
at least somewhat harder to make sure that you meet your nutrient needs. And obviously, the more that you cut out, the harder you're going to have to work to make sure that your needs are met. So for example, while most people are eating a standard non-restrictive diet, so they're not cutting out any foods, no foods are off limits, um, while they don't have to worry about B12, vegans do, obviously, right? Like we are not getting B12 in our diet, we need to supplement for it. Also, while most people eating a standard non-restrictive diet don't have to worry about overall protein or particular amino acids, vegans do to some extent. It really is important that we make sure that we are eating enough lysine-rich foods like beans. Obviously, this will probably make the diet difficult if you don't like beans. And for the carnivore crowd, it is even more extreme because, again, this is an even more uh, restrictive diet than a vegan diet, than even a keto diet. So this is just a sample day of eating that I got from zerocarbhealth.com. They had like a sample menu. It's just eggs and bacon for breakfast, chicken thighs with like Parmesan cheese for lunch, and then sirloin for dinner. It provides more than many of us like smaller people need in a day in terms of calories, so like most women, while falling far short on numerous nutrients like, unsurprisingly, vitamin C and fiber. So let's start with fiber and Big surprise, the the response from carnivore fans is that uh, actually fiber is really not that important. And inevitably, they will link to this study where people with idiopathic constipation eating a high fiber diet who stopped or reduced dietary fiber had significant improvement in their symptoms, while those who continued on a high fiber diet had no change. So people with Idiopathic constipation, idiopathic just means they don't know the cause of it. Um, people with idiopathic constipation who were still struggling on a high fiber diet, then being moved to a reduced or even like no fiber, zero fiber diet, having improvements, that means that no one needs fiber? Clearly, that is not what the study says. It's an interesting study, and it seems that people are right to question the significance of fiber for constipation, given that it only seems to be useful in cases where people are actually fiber deficient, they're actually eating a low fiber diet. But obviously, none of this can be generalized to the rest of us, to the non-constipated <laughs> public, right? Especially considering all of the evidence in favor of fiber. So now on to vitamin C. And first I want to say that it, it says zero here, that there is zero vitamin C in any of these meats. That's actually not true. Um, I'm using chronometer and they use the USDA databases and the NCCDB, which both list, um, again, all of these products, just zero vitamin C. That's not true. They do have small amounts of vitamin C. So you would get some amount of vitamin C from a diet like this if you ate these products raw or very lightly cooked, but it would still be well under the RDA, which is 90 milligrams for men and 75 milligrams for women. It's possibly enough to prevent scurvy, which you only need like 10 milligrams a day to do that. Um, but again, nowhere close to meeting the RDA. To do that, you would have to include specific meats like liver and again, eat them raw or lightly cooked. But as many carnivore fans will argue, uh, maybe the RDA doesn't apply to them. It doesn't apply to people eating meat. Maybe eating a meat only diet means that you don't need as much vitamin C. Glucose inhibits vitamin C. And so if you are eating a zero carb diet, you should need less. And then they will inevitably link to this study, which does talk about glucose inhibiting vitamin C during hyperglycemia. So not like normal people eating a carb heavy diet, but again, during hyperglycemia, surgical stress, or sepsis. It is not at all clear from this that eating a zero carb diet would supply enough vitamin C. That is not what the study is about. But maybe it's true. I mean, theoretically, it does make sense. And it honestly wouldn't surprise me if people eating such a diet do need less vitamin C at least to some extent. And there is some evidence for it, like this small study on 21 Maasai that found that even though they were consuming very little vitamin C, and even though they had very low levels, none of them had scurvy. But it's really just not a whole lot to go on. I mean, looking at the Maasai study, maybe they have some genetic adaptation that the rest of us don't have. I personally would not feel comfortable at all relying on only meat for vitamin C, particularly if it was cooked. There just isn't enough data suggesting that this is okay, that this is safe, especially in light of cases like this, 
where people eating a meat-only diet end up with scurvy. And perhaps most importantly, what is the downside to getting more vitamin C, like meeting the RDA or getting close to it or just eating like one one tiny food that gets you enough vitamin C because the reality is that it's really easy to get enough vitamin C. Like you could still eat a predominantly animal-based carnivore diet. Just half of one red bell pepper provides 100 milligrams of vitamin C. Or, or are we really suggesting that bell peppers are harmful? To me, all of this is really no different than when vegans say that, oh, Quackiashore isn't really a disease of protein deficiency, it's actually a disease of calorie deficiency. And as long as you are eating enough calories, you will inevitably get enough protein. Yes, it is true that you are very unlikely to run up against a severe protein deficiency eating enough calories from plants, like virtually any plants, but that doesn't mean that there aren't benefits to protein beyond just preventing severe deficiency. So obviously there are a lot more problems um, beyond just vitamin C and fiber when we're looking at a meat-only diet, which, again, carnivore fans will say aren't really problems, that you don't really need as much potassium, magnesium, etc. Again, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not true. We just don't have enough data to say with any sort of confidence that a meat-only diet is safe. But there are so many people saying that they got healthier and they cured their whatever after switching to a meat-only diet. There are tons of people saying they got healthier and cured their whatever after switching to a vegan diet, a low-fat vegan diet, a paleo diet, a keto diet, an Atkins diet, a Mediterranean diet, whatever diet, you name it, you will find testimonials for it. And this isn't at all surprising. Virtually any diet, assuming that you can stick with it, will result in weight loss, and weight loss typically results in improved health, assuming that you needed to lose weight. A diet like paleo, keto, low-fat vegan, even the super extreme carnivore diet will likely lead to weight loss even if you aren't trying to restrict calories simply because you are restricting so many foods. By doing this, you are essentially eliminating the possibility of eating those um, super delicious, high reward foods that we can't stop eating. So on a low carb diet, paleo, keto, keto carnivore, whatever, um, it's really hard to make these sorts of foods because you are missing one important component, right? You are missing the sugary, carby component. If you've ever had like a burger with lettuce versus a burger with a nice like fluffy sesame seed bun, there's no comparison. Similarly, on the low fat side of things, vegan or not, it's really hard to make these super delicious foods because you are missing another important element, the fatty uh, part of that equation, right? Sugary, fatty, salty foods. Um, if you've ever had oil-free hummus, you know that it's, it's just not the same. At that point, it's just like bean paste. These types of diets can work really well for those of us like me who just don't do the everything in moderation thing so well. I can moderate things like ice cream and chips and whatever for like two to three days <laughs> and then inevitably I just eat like four servings in a sitting. It's why I tend to do best weight wise. I don't feel any differently otherwise, to be honest. But in terms of my weight, I tend to have the easiest time eating a lower carb, higher protein, higher fat sort of diet because it essentially eliminates all of those carby, fatty foods that I love. Finally, obviously any diet that eliminates a certain food or certain food group is an elimination diet. And obviously a carnivore diet is like a super extreme one, right? You're only eating meat. If someone's condition was being exacerbated by some food or foods that they were eating, and now on the carnivore diet, they are no longer eating those foods, then of course it makes sense that they would see a reduction or even complete elimination of their symptoms. But that doesn't mean that it is the carnivore 
carnivore diet specifically that is making them feel better. It's far more likely that they would feel better on any diet that eliminates those specific foods that they're sensitive to. It's very similar to people going vegan and feeling better and seeing a reduction or complete elimination of certain symptoms, even people who were type 2 diabetic no longer needing medication. It's unlikely that this is a result of eating zero animal products, but far more likely that it's just a result of eating better, eating less processed foods, eating less refined carbs, eating more plants, more fiber, probably eating less calories overall. It's very likely that they would see similar results on a similar omnivore diet. Now I'm sure people on all sides will say, yeah, but I tried all of the diets. I tried every single one. And the only one that worked was low fat vegan, paleo, carnivore, whatever. Yeah, no, you haven't. I'm not trying to be a dick, but everyone says this and it's just impossible to believe. There are so many, so many different diets. It is highly unlikely that you, number one, tried them all. Number two, tried them accurately, right? So like actually keeping carbs low enough to reach ketosis or actually keeping your fat low enough, you know, 10% or below. And three, tried them for long enough. And even if you think you did, even if you think you did all of these things, there is a high chance that you didn't. We know that people are really bad at keeping track of what they eat, at estimating like how much they've eaten. It's why using food surveys in research is typically a bad idea, and it's why so much of nutrition research is unreliable. So anyway, my point is that we shouldn't be impressed by testimonials, by anecdotes for any diet. They seem really impressive, but they just aren't. They just don't tell us much at all. The plural of anecdote is not data. Okay, so obviously I would be remiss not to mention just how irresponsible this diet is. Any diet that is predominated by animal products is absolute garbage when it comes to animal welfare, the environment, unless you're like meeting all of your needs from like eggs from a backyard hen or something, which you're not doing that. The animal welfare part is obvious. The vast majority of meat comes from factory farms where animals are reared in just truly horrible, incredibly cruel conditions and then slaughtered, often incompetently and painfully so. And humane rearing conditions aren't much better than that, if they're even better at all. And the environmental concern is also pretty obvious. Animal products, particularly beef, the one that carnivore fans seem to be the most enamored with. These foods are incredibly inefficient compared to staple plant foods like grains and beans. And there is no way around this right now. You know, clean meat is a thing eventually, but it likely will not be available on any sort of large scale for many, many years. The only solution is to eat more plants and less animal products, and ideally making the animal products that you do eat more efficient sources like milk and eggs. Climate change is real, and I think all of us have at least somewhat of an obligation to do what we can to help combat it. Obviously not everyone can go vegan, but everyone can reduce their animal product consumption to some extent. And there are other issues too with eating this this sort of diet, um, you know, antibiotic resistant bacteria and foodborne illnesses. I'm not going to go into detail here. This video is long enough, but if you want more information, I talk about it more in this video. I'm going to look so stupid when they remove eye cards. <laughs> So many of my videos, I'm just going to be pointing to nothing. So wrapping this up, obviously I didn't talk about cholesterol and saturated fat, LDL, stuff like that. You're talking about people who don't think that any of this matters and that it doesn't really matter if your LDL is high or not. I mean, if there's one thing that we know in nutrition that's important, like the, the strongest connection that we have is the connection between LDL and CBD, but okay. So yeah, I guess to wrap this up, um, I think the worst part to me personally about the carnivore diet is just how many people it's going to let down. How many people will go into it thinking that it's going to cure their diabetes or their arthritis or it's going you know, to finally let them get the weight off and reach their ideal weight and then it just doesn't. Or how many people will think that this is it, this is finally the diet that they're going to be able to stick to. And then nope, 
it's just another failed diet and now they're yo-yo dieting and now they've gained the weight back. How many people has this already happened to? We just haven't heard about it because not many people are going to be willing to admit that they were desperate enough to try a meat-only diet. Unfortunately, this is not unique to the carnivore diet and people who promote the carnivore diet. Popular, well-known promoters of paleo, of keto, of vegan, particularly low-fat vegan, they all do this shit. They all oversell the results of the diet, they all end up promoting the diet as easier than it actually is, and they all end up inevitably letting people down. It's really shameful, it's really unethical, no matter who's doing it. So I just wanted to end with this quote from Dr. Aaron Carroll, if people want to avoid foods, even if there's no reason to, is that really a problem? The answer is yes, because it makes food scary. And being afraid of food with no real reason is unscientific, part of the dangerous trend of anti-intellectualism that we confront in many places today. So given this quote, it would be really easy for me to bring up the connection between the carnivore diet and the alt-right. Obviously, Michaela Peterson is a big promoter of this diet, and she is also the daughter of Jordan Peterson, who also eats the diet. Um, the alt-right darling that he is, the uh, promoter of the cultural Marxism, postmodernism conspiracy theory. But obviously this would not be fair. Uh, vegans tend to be left-leaning, and it's pretty clear that a lot of vegans believe some really dumb shit like Alex Jones-level conspiracy shit. And look, there are vegan Trump supporters too, just like I'm sure there are liberal carnivores. But I do agree with Dr. Carroll that this trend of anti-intellectualism certainly extends to diet, it extends to the way that we eat, and someone's beliefs regarding the one true diet could be seeping out into other areas of their life and influencing um, other beliefs. It's not surprising at all to me that people who believe that there is one um, natural diet or one diet that is perfect for humans, whether they think that diet is vegan or paleo, whatever, are more likely to be anti-vax, anti-GMO, pro-alternative medicine. It's a problem. So that's really it. As you could see, a lot of the um, problems with the carnivore diet uh, extend to the vegan diet, at least the way that it's often promoted. Again, people relying on anecdotes, people relying on shoddy evidence or really limited evidence, you know, cherry picking, ignoring the possibility of nutrient deficiencies because they don't want to admit that any diet that is restrictive is going to be more work. Obviously, I don't think that it is on the same uh, level as like a carnivore diet. Obviously, I think that a vegan diet can be done healthfully. Even a low-fat vegan diet, which I'm not a fan of, I think is a million times healthier and more balanced than a carnivore diet. Even a keto diet, I've talked about keto on here before. I even tried a keto vegan diet for a very, very short period. Um, even that, I am way less concerned about that <laughs> than I would be a carnivore diet. Again, on keto, you're at least eating plants, right? I mean, even if you're eating a lot of meat, you're at least eating plants, and maybe that has some sort of protective factor when it comes to, again, CBD. And of course, a vegan keto diet where you're eating all plants, there's even less concerns there. We don't really know a whole lot about limiting carbs to that degree. We just don't have enough uh, data on what happens to the body when it's been in ketosis for super long periods of time. So anyway, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, guys. Subscribe, that's pretty cool. Support the channel, patreon.com slash a natural vegan. And I'll have a new video very soon.